Welcome, Peter, and welcome everybody. We're back. Today, Peter and I are just going to go in to what we learned about the subtypes and what we feel is important and what we learned when and why and just details that we wanted to share. Peter, why don't you start? Well, um, we were speaking a little bit earlier about this because you and I have been involved in the uh, study of subtypes for a long time. And when I first learned the Enneagram back in the late 1970s, in fact, they followed very quickly after learning the nine types. But a lot of people don't know a lot about subtypes or even the word subtype sounds like it's some kind of derivation that you might get to if you're really interested. But actually, they're so much a fundamental part of the Enneagram system. Then there are a lot of reasons for that. And, you know, what's, of course, what's fascinating is to see that, well, we start with three, you know, this is a system of threeness. So we start with three, three centers and three triads based on the dominant center, body types, feeling types, and head types. And then we get to nine personality types. And now we're talking about three versions of each of the nine types, which it has to do with their instinctual subtype. And those variations are hugely important. And they really combine with the time. It, it very, you know, our instincts are, you know, a lot of our lives are lived from emotion and instinct. Yes. You know, we're not always okay with that because we really like to think we're making decisions from our head. And, you yeah. know, to some degree that's true, but so much of it is emotion and instinct that we we kind of take for granted because it's such a familiar uh, pattern. And and so when we talk about the Enneagram instinctual subtypes, we're starting to get into like, so what's happening in that body center and how it connects to the heart center and how it kind of fuels our point of view and our way of seeing the world. And, and of course, as you know, we've got these and many people listening now also at this point, but, you know, somehow, you know, a lot of people are learning about the nine Enneagram types and they don't know a lot about the subtypes. So we're here today to talk about it. And you have such a deep background in it, uh, as I do. And so we're, I think we're, <laughs> it's good we're talking about it. Yeah, it's good we're talking, getting those pieces out there. Yeah, and that nothing was just like random. Everything had a pattern to it. And it was just a matter of finding those patterns. So when I met Naranjo, I asked, why is it the core fear of the type with the core fear of the instinct merging and creating that? perspective. And he said, yes, but, but how he started was to take a Chazo's three triads, which we call head, heart, and gut, but Chazo uh, didn't call them centers of intelligence. He called them instinctual triads. And then he had conservation that we call gut and self-preservation, the higher and lower level. Let me just go back a minute. Like if we say head, heart, and gut, it's at the ego level. If we say sexual, social, and self-pres, it's at the it, more the primitive, even more unconscious level. Whereas Achazu didn't have subtypes. They were an addition made by Naranjo because he noticed that people also use the id part of their personality or the more primitive part. And so it really shaped the types, and in some cases, it was the only way people could recognize themselves. So he added phobic and counterphobic six at that time, but he never added the other countertypes until I met him and, and my research revealed that there are countertypes to all of them in a stacking order. And then he confirmed that concept. But before when people had said, are there you know, counterphobic types to all the types? And he said, no, 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 that's just type six. And I said, well, I'm not talking about counterphobic. I'm talking about counter types, like the person who, the way their instinct and their type come together creates like an atypical expression of the type. It's well, it's interesting because, you know, it's true, but there's a paradox there. So like I'm a social eight. So that's the counter type, right? And I understand what that means because I'm more... You know, the self-referencing of the eight is mediated by the need to belong, you know what I mean? And to be part of groups and structured groups, yeah. you know, groups with a purpose. And so I have to mediate my eightness in order to be part of that or to be a leader of that. And 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 so I do. And and yet on the inside, you know, it's a lot of eight, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm still an eight, as you know. And, and uh, 
I was could be easily recognized as an eight when I was a young man, you know, because yeah. I was walking around being really, you know, eight like and yeah. dogs would bark and little children run to their mothers. And I'm like, what? <laughs> What's the problem? You know, yeah. that kind of eightness. So, um, Whoa, that sounds so like anyway, a personal problem to me. <laughs> so so in a way, it, it, it's fascinating because we're kind of asked to, to understand the complexity of this. And, um, and of course, we have all three instincts, which yeah. also makes it kind of complex. In other words, yeah. you know, what's my predominant instinct? Well, I know what that is pretty clearly. I'm a social instinct in the lead. And, and then the others one-to-one -one, and then the self-pres, that, that kind of stacking order. But, um, you know, it's, the instincts come up in different situations and at different times in our lives. And so some people say, oh, well, you know, I must be this subtype because this is what I'm really working with now. But you know, if you fall in love, maybe people have had the experience of that. Yeah. It's like, well, what instinct is going to be the strongest, at least for a while? You know yep. what I mean? <laughs> and then gradually things, you know, well, hopefully, I don't want to say they taper off, but, you know, people. Well, it does. Like one body of research that I did at the time of the Enneagram and intimacy is like how each type approaches intimacy. Now, I'm a sexual eight, which is also a counter type but yours is more identified as the counter type because you would be more inclined to consider the group and not want to alienate anyone in the group. Uh -huh. Whereas the sexual, I've got to be desirable. I've got to be attractive to the people that I want to be attractive to. So I'm still counter because how do you, possession, surrender, sexual aid, how do you have autonomy that the eight wants right. and have this union have that union drive. Yeah, right. That the sexual wants. Well, it's like momentarily, but it's constantly going back and forth. Right. But the drive is still for closeness. But how I'm going to do that is to create that bond that is between you and I. And in fact, one of the people that was, you remember Sonica? Yes. I think, yeah, she was great. She goes, I'm going to study you and figure out how you know everybody. And I go, I think I just talked to them. She goes, no, you have a method. I just need to know what that is. <laughs> Monica, our yeah. beloved social four. And so we were going to the conference in 1996. And apparently she was studying me. And when we were flying back, she said, well, I figured it out, Catherine. I know how you are so good with social, but not a social type. And I said, do tell. And she said, well, you create an intimate bond with everybody, like that one-on-one, -on -one, and then you know a lot of people intimately, so you can talk to them. But she said, I did notice, like, you didn't want to just do the big group thing. You'd rather go do... Right. Split intimate. off and find some one-to-one -one connection, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, imagine I'm a group leader. Imagine being a group leader with sexual subtypes. So they're always kind of yeah. like, <laughs> turning to the person next to them or yeah. moving across the room to find an intense connect. It's like, wait, come on, come back. And <laughs> I realize it's like trying to herd cats or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it like, is. do we sit in a circle for like half an hour? <laughs> like, maybe. I remember it's funny, you know, yeah, no, you, you have, nervous. right. You, you make more intense contact with people, for example, than I do. I'm like, I, I'm like, you know, I mean, I'm an eight, so I'm somewhat you're friendly. Intense. You're flipping the burgers, everything. Well, you know, good. I don't want to go deep and intense with everybody. I'm like, you know, so, yeah. so well, you can funny. have a meaningful connection and discussion. Yeah. Now, that's because you're sexual second. Right, right. No, I understand. I like my sexual uh, friends because <laughs> I like the intensity, but I have a point at which I'm ready to, it's like, okay, enough. And, you know, usually about at the 60 minute mark, sometimes a little longer. But they'll <laughs> stay up all night talking intensely. I'm like, yeah, you know. we do. We do. We do. So, it's, yeah. But the other part, you know, that attraction repulsion of the sexual instinct, what we don't own is that we kind of discard. Right. Or, or there isn't the energy. Right. And now let's say we're in a group and we want to know everybody that's different. But if we're just in life, we're just tuning in to the person that we feel on the same wavelength with. I understand so that. So it's socials that would say to me, yeah, Catherine, you know, I noticed when you were talking to this person, you were laughing. 
And when we were talking, you weren't. I said, well, maybe it wasn't, we weren't having a funny conversation. She said, no, I think it's when you're with a, another sexual subtype or someone you know really well that you just go into that intimate discussion. There's no need for the interview overview. Go, right, right. That's it. It's like the sexual subtypes, excuse my language, it's like they want to penetrate us. Yes, that's right. And sometimes I don't want to be penetrated. <laughs> You yes. know, and sometimes it's great, but you know what I'm saying? It's like there's, I, you know, not as much as you, you know what I mean? So. Uh, yeah. Or uh, yeah, I feel like the socials want to put a choke chain on me. I hear you. And, and I, like. I apologize. You... It's social, on behalf of the social subtypes, I apologize. <laughs> it's true. A lot of social subtypes want to kind of like tone it down, be organized, be part, be a good group member. Don't be so quite so whatever. As an aid, I think I, I'm more likely to kind of enjoy the energy. But yeah, you, know, you do. Still, still. You do. And also, we could say sometimes as a social subtype or even tell a it's like, you know, we could probably get there <laughs> with you if you gave us a little time. You know what I mean? It's like some of us, we have to kind of like, uh, you know, I'm sure that's way too slow. But, you know what I mean? But that immediate, like how you can just sail in and see someone and pick up on the energy and then just get right in there with them. Yeah, and we kind of know. It's like a little nee 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 nee. Right. I don't know we're doing that. And then it goes nee 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 nee. Okay, something in common. And I love the way the socials in looking for that interview overview, they're really looking for common denominators. Oh, you went here, you went there. So I wove it into all my trainings because to include the socials and I made sure there was always food and what have comfort for the self press and then ways in which there'd be dyads for the sexual. But because all three are important in my opinion. Right. But right. Yeah, if you want to have a good party, you need all the subtypes. You don't need all the nine Enneagram types, actually. You, you do. Sometimes hard, but but you do need this all three subtypes showing up. To They're the best parties. Work. Agreed. For sure. Well, you know, what I was going to add, too, is that I didn't know until I met Naran. I said, well, what, how did you decide what qualities? And he said, well, I just took a Chazo's three triads, which was conservation, which we'd call self-pres or gut, and relation, which we call sexual and heart. And then adaptation was his later term. He did have symphony at one time for the social and the head center. So the layers being, according to Naranjo, whether it was at the id level or the primitive, but he took all three of those triads at their primitive level and put them, this is Peter's- uh, My God, you have a, a, an original, well, yeah. an early chart, right? Yeah. That yep. Kathy Spieth made many years ago. I believe so. From That's what we it. Yeah. yeah. So he would put all three triads under the eight, the seven, and then recognize that we used all three right. of these subtypes. But one was just like, he called it a mini passion. At that time, we didn't realize how important these instincts are. Or like my research revealed that people who knew nothing about the Enneagrams, who had no prejudices to what something should or shouldn't be, found that their instinct issues were more dominant than their type. And that the primitive, like, must do this, like logistics, time, energy, money for the self-pres, or am I in the group or out? Where do I need to belong? What's my role? The way the socials think, and then the sexual weight. Are you someone I want to talk to or not? Or how, how am I going to talk to you? What am I going to be able to share to make, to give meaning to the conversation we just had? And that we're, we're just doing that, really. And then I'm doing it the way an eight would do it. And you're doing right. the social the way a, an eight would right. do it. Right, an eight would do it. So it's that combination. It's funny, every time you say primitive, I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, I know it's true, but I'm like, wait a minute, that's the life force coming through yeah. us, you know? It's, yeah, it's how we how about invest. Primal? <laughs> primal, I will. Primal, it's I It's closer, think. I guess, you know what I mean? I mean, because it's really such a wonderful and valuable energetic quality within us, yeah. and to be able to manage that 
because it, it actually has a lot to say about what's most important in terms of our projects, places, people, you know what I mean? Kind of like where we invest our life force. And, um, you know, there's no, we can't say if you're this subtype, you are going to do this, but there are patterns and archetypes that show up. And, um, you know, it's like, uh, in, a, in a sense, it's about our path in life. It makes sense that we really want to pay attention and make sure that we have some choice in the matter. You know what I mean? We're not just kind of acting out the instincts because, you know, when it, the archetypes and the instinct, archetypes and instincts, archetypes maybe would be the types and the instincts is like the, you know, the, the earth, you know, connection. It's like the engine, you know, it's like right. the fire underneath the intellectual. And it's good and it's vital, but these big impersonal forces really don't care about our particular choice. You know what I mean? Trying to work with this stuff and create choice is really a big deal. And most people in most times of, you know, history, they, they didn't have the knowledge or the awareness to even begin to make those choices. Certain people did, of course, that kept the knowledge going. But, yes. you know what I mean? It's like, I don't want to be just be run around by my instincts. I want to have the goodness and the live aliveness of my instincts, but I don't want them, you know, just running me yeah, through. Yeah, to, to kind of undermine us, really, is what they can do if we're unconscious. Of right. The, the they can be very automatic and unconscious. So exactly. this will, yeah. Right. So because we can make it conscious. And, you know, I can look back now and realize that I thought people were lying to me. Like, what? You want to start over and say that again? Or wait, let me get this straight. You're saying, and then I, but it was really just the eight trying to get it kind of in a way that I could understand what went wrong and what I needed to change, like right. in business. But even with my kids or friends, I'd say, wait, you said you went to Daniel's house at three was it three or four let's get it straight let's get the right time first let's get the timeline here and yet like why is the eight doing that well the eight wants control but why does the eight want control because we have a fear that we are going to be harmed in some way or manipulated in some way that we don't want so if we know all the details and we have the facts in the way that we want them we're much more inclined to feel like we can answer or handle the problem. But the visceral part comes up so fast when we're kids and when we don't know, or like you had older brothers in eight, I had a father that was in eight and a son that's in eight. And what I can tell you with all of us is that visceral part comes up really fast, even if we're joking. Right, that's true. I mean, we are body-based types. Both yes. Bodies, so. yes. Yep. I would just add that my experience is that there's a system of threeness here that could actually stand apart from the Enneagram. Maybe that's not the right way to say it, but like if we, we you know, sometimes people can identify their subtype before they know their Enneagram type. Right. Sometimes I can pick up on somebody's subtype before I know their Enneagram type because there's an energetic <laughs> quality there. You know what I mean? Now that's not all the time and I don't want to project that on people but sometimes it's just kind of like obvious like oh wow this person is really coming through with strong sexual energy one-to-one -one energy or strong social energy or strong self-preservation energy and we can talk about different styles and different styles and relationships and different priorities which is very true and sometimes it's just kind of like this energetic field that people walk around with and, yeah and it speaks to us and it speaks to others and it's all of this relating and acting and participating in the world around us that just kind of comes from our life force and is shaped by our primary instinct or our subtype. Excellent. That's such an important point, Peter. And we're just doing it all the time. And, you know, I asked Neron, when did you start adding them? He said, well, I've never taught all 27. He called them archetypes, these qualities of the types and he said I didn't have all 27 and the first time he taught it was in the training with me because my research validated his thoughts on the issue because he didn't work with thousands of people or have thousands of participants but because his background was as an early researcher on personality you know I think I mentioned in our other video that he had a scholarship to Ohio State that was leading the country in research studies 
And then Harvard, he got a Fulbright scholarship. So he went there and then he was invited to Berkeley and then came back to Berkeley. He loved it so much and made it his home. But he also taught at UC Santa Cruz and do Couples Institute, all doing personality research. So that was his thing. And it was mostly qualitative research. So that's why he liked what I had done. Because you did a lot of research too. I mean, I just want to acknowledge you as the kind of, uh, to me, the, the really the leader of the research into the Enneagram types and the subtypes and, and, and other things that you researched and, and that you really went out and gathered like thousands of people to respond. And, yeah, uh, thousands and thousands. Right. And you want to say anything, what, what caught your interest there? I mean, you oh. became a researcher and. Well, I had always liked typology since I was a little kid. And one of the first little books on typologies was a little Dell book that they were about this big, they were the cash register. And it was, well, they had numerology. They had one on the visual archetypes, Chinese facial expressions, what you could read about people. And just think of anything that was kind of emerging in the 60s of other ways of mixing East and West as to how you could evaluate people. And so the reason it was important wasn't just my interest. My father wanted us all, four children, to be able to do critical thinking. So we had to read a book and then be able to discuss the book and the pros and cons of the book and the merits. And I, you know, I was only seven when we started that. And so my first book I chose was Superman. <laughs> I thought, oh, I fooled him. I'm going to read this little skinny magazine. And he goes, no, you've got to tell me about the archetypes of the hero and the protagonist and the whole story. And I go, oh, okay. So that's what we did. And that's what I did with these little books, the pros and cons, like what I had learned. And then later when I was in high school, they added, instead of taking economics, you could take psychology, social problems, it was called. And it was added my senior year. We didn't have it before that. And the point being that they had learned at that time. So all the people at Berkeley that were doing the research, all of Naranjo's cohorts, had discovered that there was a psychological component to social problems. And that's why kind of the belief at the time in psychology was we needed to understand the psychology. And I happened to have a teacher who had just gotten her master's at UC Berkeley. So she was a part of that same little melting pot, or really not a melting pot, just hotbed. Of, right seeing things in a new way where the professors and the students had the discussions. Were you living there at that time, like in the 60s? No, no, I wasn't there till 75. And, you know, I was off doing my social aid thing, you know. <laughs> I didn't know that I had that language or that understanding entirely, but it grew on me slowly, you know, that there were challenges and problems, both, you know, yeah. excess showing up. Well, it was social good justice timing. efforts. That while Naranjo was getting ready to go off, he had met Achazo and was gathering together his cohorts to go back down to Chile for that 10-month training. I had this, this crazy, enthusiastic person that would have been a counterphobic 638 that was gung-ho on social problems and psychology and what we needed to know as individuals to make a difference in the world. And so she had us do term papers and would assign things or presentations and research. My first research was on empathy. She had assigned that to me. And I go, what's empathy? <laughs> That's just like, you, you feel that stuff? What difference does that make? It just slows you down. But that's when it started for me because we had to have 10 people we interviewed. Well, by the time I interviewed my brothers, my parents, my neighbors, my friends, it just kept growing until I had over 100 people. And that's kind of a pretty strong indicator when I become interested in something. I go deep. And I found that people didn't know the difference between sympathy and empathy and understanding and how they described it and what mattered more to them. And later, because I knew these people, I could put them into their Enneagram types and their centers and their subtypes and made even more sense. But that was my first qualitative research and I was hooked. But I said, I'll never do this again. I'm never gonna do a term paper when I leave. Okay, college. When I leave college, I'll never do a term paper again. Right. 
Right. But of course, every one of these is like a term paper because I have to go find out from everybody and I have to right. go put it all together. Right. But that's well, how it started for me. I just want to acknowledge you for all the research you've done, and it was just been very useful to say the least. And uh, it was not, very few people want to do that kind of research. So good on yeah. you. Too. What was I thinking, Peter? I just, <laughs> but I wanted the answer. I, is what I wanted to understand people more. And I've been a manager for years, developing people, and I felt the best way to help them grow as a person was to understand what gave them personal empowerment. So all the typologies that I taught before the Enneagram, I was using, and microexpressions, body language, behavior analysis, all that I had studied. So when I learned the Enneagram, Enneagram was the one system that could literally hold all other systems. That if we started with the Enneagram, then they all made sense. But if we started with the other systems, there was always going to be something that would lead us astray. Right. And yet it was like this perfect unfolding. Well, it's like one ring to bind them, you know. Yeah. Spiritual key, <laughs> yeah. you know, brings it all together. And yeah, um, the rings of power. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, I I agree, and I I know that sounds strange to people and psychological field like well what do you mean it is a weird enneagram stuff it's like well actually it's it, you know and of course this is a little mysterious about why the enneagram per se yes. but it is you know there's intelligence in the diagram and of course we know the enneagram has been used for you know i won't say centuries but really probably longer than that in terms of organizing information yeah it didn't start with personality types it started with other oh. things but now we see Enneagram is wonderful at collating and organizing all this wonderful psychology. And I always like to remind people, it's like the Enneagram did not invent the personality types. No. They are all found in the psychological liter literature, but the Enneagram actually brought them together in a system and multiple layers of a system in a way that's extremely helpful, whether it's yeah. character structure or defense systems, or in this case, instinct types and it, boy, there's just so much clarity there with the Enneagram. So I think that's why it continues to spread throughout the world. Yeah, it, it's so real, Peter, because when I worked as a top executive where I had to handle problems and go wherever the problems were and create events and negotiate an outcome that was a win-win, which was a new term. But uh, my dad comes to mind and goes, Kate, win-win is just two losers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is an eight view. <laughs> that was an eight view. Well, Dad, I think it kind of works out a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, if it were war, it wouldn't work out. Like, oh, maybe it would, Dad, and yeah, <laughs> some yeah, level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the the point being that I wanted to be able to effectively interview people and understand what was in there what they were really like, not they had learned how to interview, but what they would say that they couldn't prepare for or plan. So I'd ask them all of these five words they would use to describe themselves to a total stranger and what would say the most about their character traits than anything else. And then I asked them why, and I asked them their greatest strength and their greatest weakness. Now that's the basis of all my work. Right. But these clusters came up and they were nine clusters. Now, I didn't know the Enneagram yet, but I knew the idealized images that went together uh -huh. and core fears that went together okay. yeah. without realizing it. Uh -huh. So when I learned the Enneagram, I thought, wow, that matches. And that's that was based on research I did with people in every facet of a department store, whether they were in shipping, whether they were a divisional manager or a buyer on the floor, or salesperson, whatever. And I, I wanted all types. And then I wanted people that would never agree to do it. And I'd talk them into it. As you know, we've talked about that okay. before. I think you're pretty good at talking people into <laughs> yeah. doing your projects. Yeah, we need you. But from there, I just had to learn the way Naranjo had modified the defense mechanisms to match the nine types. So that's why he called them defense strategies rather than mechanisms, because he had modified it from the pure mechanism. And then I thought, wow, if you get the core, the idealized image, the core fears and the defense strategies, you can recognize the types. And that's what Naranjo was observing. And it's easier to type that way. So how did you learn you were an eight? 
Oh, I went to the first public panel class in Berkeley. I say, you know, I was there at the right time. I was, I would say I was lucky, but it was more than that. I actually was in Berkeley to learn yeah. things like this and yes. come from the East Coast as a young person, a holistic counselor and a seeker. And Helen Palmer called the house one day. I was living in the group house. The women in the house were doing intuition studies with her. I was kind of like a fellow traveler. She called the house that there's a class happening. You should go. And like, okay, it's Helen, so we'll, we'll go. We had no idea. And we got to the first, uh, to this house in Berkeley, and there was a line down the block. We were the last people that got in before they had to like turn people away. Second class came to the, you know, was came to a hall, a hall you know, accommodated everybody. And, I, you know, we saw these panels of people talking about their way of being in the world and the way they see things and their concerns and fears and, and, you know, I thought this was a great way to learn psychology. It was fascinating. And then later on in the program, it came to eight night and I pretty much fell off my chair. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. These people see the world the way I do. It was so useful. It was so, I, I was grateful. It's like, oh, I have a place in the human community. There are other people like me in this world. And I was so happy for like two months. And then the other shoe dropped. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. There's a lot of work here, you know? Yeah. So. Um, because the stuff we is. think is normal, that it just makes sense to us. It right. doesn't to people of the other types. Right. And of course, being a good leader type, I had a center in Berkeley and a big dance studio and a holistic center. And so I said to Kathleen Speeth, I said, you know, you could come to our place we because we have a nice space and we'll help you advertise this stuff. And, so before we knew it, we were hosting the early Enneagram classes. Uh, and then uh, soon thereafter, Helen Palmer started teaching the Enneagram too at the YWCA. And so there was like hundreds of people every week going Friday nights to our place and Sunday nights to Helen. And I mean, it's like, it was such an exciting time. It was very concentrated. Yeah. You had to be around. You had to know somebody, you know what I mean? It was, it was very concentrated. You did, yeah, because I didn't know about it. And if I had, I would have gone. Yeah. Well, because yeah. I went to everything else, so it wasn't until the you know the first books came out that it started actually kind of immediately started getting out to everybody because yes. you know you yeah. could read the book, you know, and the first conference really bringing together. I think it was what twelve hundred people with that first conference, yeah, spent. or, or fourteen hundred depending on how you counted them, right? And everyone was kind of like their own satellite teaching, like I'd been using it for like nine years with the clients I already had right. and new people coming in. But it was wonderful to meet other people from other schools, other teachings, who got what, when. Right, in other countries, you know, like, yep. really? You know, Sister, Sister Suzuki was there from Japan. It was like this little Catholic, yeah. you know, who had been teaching the Enneagram in Japan. And, you know, I got to ferry her around in my big van because, of course, we had to go from <laughs> one end of the Stanford campus to the other. And I'm like driving very, very carefully, you know what I mean? Being good, her <laughs> sister Suzuki, you know, because she was like this treasure. Yes. I was showed up at, you know, our conference. You know, or people from Ireland who said, oh, yeah, we've got all of in the parishes. We all hear something about the Enneagram. I'm like, we didn't know that the Jesuits had like spread it all around the world in the Catholic yeah. system. That was new, you know. Like through no the idea. Catholic pipeline. And then the, it's kind of a Christian pipeline as well. Whatever uh, the Christians, whether they're Catholic or Protestant or other right. variations right. of the Christian. Well, we were the psychology people similar. or transpersonal psychology yes. people, yeah. let's say. Because there was always, Helen Palmer had always been very, you know, like we need to integrate psychology and spirituality. And, yes. Yes. Uh, you know, and I respected Helen and I was okay with that, but I wasn't interested in spirituality. I didn't come for that. <laughs> and of course, as I worked on my type structure over a number of years, I started having spiritual experiences. So yes. I kind of got it, you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, there's an integration there. So, but the subtypes, come back to our theme, um, yeah. integrates the neurobiology, you sure. know, because it's, it's in our bodies, you know, and it's not to say that we're, it's not cast in stone. I mean, you know, we can work with it, but, but, you know, parents know that the kids show up with a certain something there, a certain spirit, a certain temperament. No question. Kids are not all the same. And we didn't do, I mean, we just, you know, before we even raised them, they just showed up. <laughs> That's right. 
something there. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning. That's the basis for, I mean, it's affected by epigenetics and changes in early nurture, of course, but you know, I mean, neurobiology. So. We are born with our focus of attention, like what we track. You think? Like yeah. What was positively yeah. received or rejected, like my right. mom's, just like your father. She thought that was good and bad. Right. <laughs> but probably. she was yeah. surrounded by AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she was. She was in it. She at least had one for son. But yeah, there's just a way in which it just explained things or how my father and I were so similar. We were both ENTPs as well with our F and T very close. But he was instead the social aid. So more the merrier. My friends, my brother's friends, all four kids could have friends over. And that was great with my dad. Right. My mom is the self pres extremely introverted for it was like, whoa, she'd go in her room and lock the door. I should say she'd be okay when we weren't fighting. But right. when we we're little kids fighting, she just couldn't take it. And she'd go in the room and lock the door because she needed to reconstellate. And 469, for those who know tritype, but it was the self pres She needed to, and that introversion to kind of, find herself again and then come back up or I'd be no I couldn't wait I'd be I'm like a little three-year-old pushing notes under the door because I'm knocking it's locked she won't open it so I'm yeah, right. well God the bless the self-preservation subtypes all around the Enneagram because they're the ones that take care of the material infrastructure of the world we wouldn't be here it's not to say that only self-preservation people engage in these activities in the world you know the the growing of the food, the building of the buildings, the, yeah. the banks, the vans, all of that practical, tangible material stuff. But it's it's self-preservation people are the, are the major folks there and the leaders of it often enough. And so, I mean, I, you know, they just, we and wouldn't be here without all of world, that. In the physical world. Right. Self-pres is the defense of the defensive. So even though we have self-pres, social and sexual, Still, if there was like an earthquake, we're going to be aware of our physical world immediately. Yeah, we're going to go all right to self-preservation, right? But then what we do thereafter. But right. And the way Nar Naranjo saw it, and it's kind of proven to be true with the research, is that it's first, there's two ways to look at it, but that there's the self-preservation, which is the sustenance that the child needs. And... Certainly it's the person, but it's the resource that sustenance could come just from the mother if we're breastfed or it could come from multiple people if we were bottle fed. But it's like wanting our stuff, the things that you know fill our belly. A certain kind of security, you know what yeah. I mean? And, and yeah. it is about food and warmth and shelter, but it's also about a kind of a being held, you know, it's like that quality of oneness, you know, like yeah. when the God talked about there's no such thing as a human infant. There's only a mother-child unit, you know, and there's not a lot of individuation there until later. Yes. And, you know, some, I think other subtype, well, anyway, in the whole individuation process is its own topic. But, yes, uh, yes. You know, and we all started in that, we all began yeah. there, but some of us went in different directions as we got older, you know. and Or the dissatisfaction, if there isn't someone in your family or your extended family that's the same instinct. There's a way you can, as a sexual, be close, but like I was close to my social aid aunt and my social aid father, but there was no sexual. But one brother had, he was also a gut type of one, he had self pres and sexual really close. So if right. he could endure it, we could get to where I wanted to go right. with it. But, you know, no, I've heard about this. It's like people saying, I was the only this kind of subtype in my family of origin. And I just felt like I wasn't as connected. Yeah. You know, as a parent, I see, I, you know, we had three kids and two girls and, you know, girls, uh, teenage girls run in packs. You know what I mean? It's like, they, <laughs> yeah. run in, and we see the groups go through. It's like, Oh, hi dad. We're going to get something to eat and go downstairs. Like, okay, fine. And I mean, it was lovely. So much vitality. Yeah. yeah. But you could start to see and sense 
the subtype differences. And in fact, the, the groups would talk about that. They would say, oh, well, she's not here with us this weekend because she's with her family again, you know, and their family is gathering over there and they're doing this whole thing at the whatever. And, you know, and they would be kind of a little, you know, bothered by that. Or they'd say, uh, oh, well, she's not here because she's with that boyfriend. You know, that yeah. boyfriend? You're talking about like 15 year olds, you know what I mean? It's and she's spending well. all her time with that boyfriend and, you know, she doesn't have time for us anymore. And you know what I mean? So uh, yeah. anyway, and, you know, it was just from the social instinct running those groups, not that yeah. they were social subtypes, yeah. but it was a group, you know what I mean? And and you could see how, you know, the, the it's a pack. Yeah, it. it's definitely a pack of girls have their, like what my dad called mutual admiration society. Because at that age, you're saying, oh, you have, you have great hair. Oh, well, you have great teeth. Right. Oh, well, you, you're great. You can talk to anybody. Yeah, right. Yeah, the boys didn't run in packs the same way, but, you know. <laughs> but see, I joined the Boy Scouts. So I was part of an organized social structure early on. And of course, became a patrol leader and then a troop leader. And, you know what I mean? Did my well, social thing, starting with the uh, Boy Scouts at, at age 10. You know, and did you do the Eagle Scout and all that where you stayed? Over? Well, I got close, but uh, I didn't go all the way. I got, yeah, I had other interests that showed up. <laughs> I mean, girls did show yeah. up at some point, yeah. you know, in a big way. So, yeah, I had a boyfriend that was an Eagle Scout and he knew how to do everything. But my dad taught us how to do everything. But right. he also learned a lot in the war as a captain in the Marines. But mm -hmm. it was, kind of survival was a part of it and what you had to do. So he wanted us to be able to stay out all night and get our own food, whatever, but we never did that. He just showed us how when we'd go camping in, case, in yeah. Mexico yeah. or what have you. Yeah. Like right. How to make a, you know, a hook out of anything. So yeah. Even though, though my dad was social, just aid in general wants to know everything to be able to handle their own world. And not be dependent at least enough you know what i mean and have yeah. to make a fire and have shelter and you know whatever yeah. so and then the social on the other hand comparing to the self press we need them to bring people together and the whole tribal system is like safety and security in numbers, strength in numbers well that's what i'm always always felt like as an aid you know we're going to have more power if you're interested in power, which I was, because if you don't have power in this world, you're going to be, you know, in bad shape. Uh, people yeah. will oppress you. But um, but there's power in groups. And sometimes I say that to my sexual subtype friends, you know, you are big and charismatic and you're intense and great. And you're just one person. So yeah. keep yeah. in mind that there's power in organized groups, you know, that any 10 people can generally outperform and out protect and that's true whatever work that's true a single person no matter how and but of course there's a lot of charismatic leaders who are sexual subtypes who, who are leaders and and join with a group the group brings right. them in too right. or there's a good relationship between the two usually if they're charismatic sexual types socials a very strong second well, I I was the social type for my sexual subtype leaders. You know, David and Helen Palmer, the founders of the Mary tradition, were both sexual or one to one sixes. You know, man, could they be uh, compelling and attract people and impact yeah. people? And that was their whole thing. And yet, when it came to creating a network or an organization, it was like, okay, I know how to do this. Let me, you know, be the guy that you know. Yeah connects everybody from around the world and because they did they just didn't know how to which is fine they don't we don't have to do everything we just need enough of each of the three instincts to sure. you know have some access to them but we don't have to be strong in each i mean you know what i'm saying yeah i mean that's what we, we teach in businesses is we just have to teach the the team about the instincts they don't have and what to consider right. but yes you know i i really back to the kind of the 14 for me it's like I was in this club I'd grown up with some kids in elementary school and then we went to the same junior high and I met new kids but there were definite groups and by the time we went to high school there were four main groups of girls there were guys too but let's say the girls 
and they were so competitive with one another. And there was only one boys club. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, why are we giving the money to the YMCA when we could just take that money ourselves and do something for charity to help people still, but put the money into our, you know, our pockets and then have parties that would attract the boys. And then I thought, okay, that worked. We got the boys, but then the other girls clubs were doing that too. And I'm thinking, but if we put all the girls together, the boys will come and it won't matter. And we were a, a especially close group in the really class of 1970. And we just really did melt. And so that, even though I was a sexual, because of that intimate relationship that I had with all the people in these different groups, I made a compelling request for merging. And we did merge. And right. then it was great fun. Right. Well, you had some good, some enough social instinct to, to know your way in and out of all that. So, and you, well, and I knew I just didn't want, I wanted, the, I wanted the boys all together. You were, it was in the service, ultimately. It was, it was in service. Social instinct. Right. instinct. I get that. <laughs> yeah. And then the, so that leads right to the sexual, which we need to have an intimate bond kind of like ideally an unbreakable bond that will make it so there are people that will look out for us that would protect us rather than stab us in the back they'll protect us from people who might and the belief with the sexual one-to-one -one is that and it isn't just comfort with one-to-one -one. a lot of self-present and introverts will think oh i'm one-to-one -one because i like it better i'm talking about needing that union fusion kind of this merge that's undeniable and it's so strong that you can't like easily discard it. So it's about right. desirability. Right. And and of course, what I've noticed about sexual subtypes and relationships, they, they'll forget to eat. I mean, it just it gets yeah. so intense with the other person. They, 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 they don't eat. Somebody has to come along and remind them. That, that's why I think some sexual subtypes like to pair up with the self-preservation folks because yeah. there's a natural balancing there. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, it's it, there's fascinating combinations, you know, and what I like about looking at relationships, subtypes in relationships, there's actually only six combinations. So it's a lot easier to kind of cover the field than the types. <laughs> types is 45 combinations. Yeah, that's right. You know, but the and subtypes, 81 if you do try types, but it's like, yeah. Oh, well, that's true. There's that's a whole lot. Well, thanks a lot for yeah. everything. Well, it was already there. We just had to see it. We just had <laughs> okay. to find it. And you, you didn't create it. You just, uh, just were able to find it and discover it. Yeah, just it. find it's all mathematical, but right. it's so. just like three by three by three, which was Chazo's whole thing with trielectics. And that's why nine. Three times three is nine, but if you do the, the next three, we get our 27 tri-types and our 27 subtypes. Right, got it. Or instinctual types, however you want to look at right. it. There's only three instinctual types, but then there's a variation of each instinct. So, you know, Peter, one thing that people always ask me is kind of the meaning of the words. I really like the word you use. Peter has a chart that's really great. He talks about each instinct he has great classes on the subtypes oh well, thank you as i mentioned he uses the one that i saw as well years right, ago that's, it's it's like the original together. chart right there yeah yeah and i mean i saw that as well and then of course for those this is on my website for anybody who wants it it's got what i found when i first did the research from each category each instinct and there is one thing we need to point out is you could say self pres sexual, social, if you were thinking the dyad, and then the group, and then the individual. The reason I did it this way is Naranjo said that after we have that relationship with the nurturing force, that then we have to fit into the family system, which would be social. And that would be extended family or your family of origin. And then from there, we choose our favorite and that the sexual represents the favorite. And we're always gonna look around if you're sexual and have, we're gonna see all the, the values of people, but then want the favorite where we can have this crazy merge. But so it, you may have seen 
them broken out. Let's see how you did yours. No, you did one to one sex. You did self pres sexual, social. You know, where I just reversed the sexual and the social. Yeah, but no I mean, one did say you could do it both ways. Yeah, we can do it both ways. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I have a view on why in that order, but that's, you know, I mean, I, yeah, give the view. Yeah. It's great. Go ahead. So I should Why say that. Okay. Yeah. Well, my, see, my understanding is that with kids, the, um, there's cycles to this. And so obviously we start in self-preservation. We're all there. I mean, again, yeah. we're all, and self-preservation instinct is, is emphasized in those early years, because again, there's this kind of undifferentiated connection with the mother or primary care, caregiver. And then at a certain point, like at about the age of one, something very dramatic happens, which is the kids start to walk and then they start to run. And, and at that time, there's the beginning of the individuation. They walk away from mom. I mean, different yeah. you know, different kids do this in different ways. And different, approach mom. You know. yeah. But mm -hmm. there's this moving away and then they turn around and they look back and they go, I'm over here and mom's over there. Like, whoa, you know what yeah. I mean? It's like the beginning of the dyadic relationship, the relationship of two-ness. And, uh, and so if kids are encouraged to individuate and there's still a good home base to come back to, that's great. But of course, in a lot of families, when the kid starts to move away, it's kind of like, okay, we're busy. So, you know, have a good life. Yeah. I'm exaggerating, of course. But yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, great. There's other kids coming or there's, like, you know, stress in the family or stuff going on and and so you know and then at a certain point kids need to be in uh, playing with other kids now little kids they don't play with other kids they do this they can hang out side by side but they don't you know it takes a while to actually turn towards the other kids and i remember with my kids um around the age of three and a half or so they wanted to get out in the world. They needed more action. And so they, fortunately, we had this wonderful preschool available. And, and so this was their first social structure. It was a very, you know, gentle and flexible social structure. You know, the, the real social structure came in elementary school. I mean, that's like, you know, <laughs> you got, you're in a social structure here. So anyway, that's, that's just my experience of it. But I'm not saying that, you know, my view oh, is the no, correct it, view. It's it, just interesting. It's very interesting. That's why I say I can make a case for both. Just the reason I did it the other way was the, right. the focus on desirability. But we want to be desirable from a pretty young age. But one thing I have noticed, Peter, is that kids that are sexual will kind of select a, a favorite before the age of three and do it again and again and again for like, I just remember... Our, there was a boy that I liked. He didn't even have to be my age. He could be older. But there's always a boy that I liked. There was never not a boy that I liked. And it wasn't just because I had three brothers. It was because the attention went to the favorite playmate, which a lot of times for me were boys because maybe that was influenced by my brothers, you know, blowing up army men and, you know, using firecrackers and taking the dolls that I would get that I didn't want, but I'd have to act all nice. Oh, I just love this. Thank you. And then I'd put the clothes on my cats instead because I just, that wasn't what I enjoyed doing. I, I liked the energy of blowing up the little army men more. So we could say that was the social group. I was socialized in like a, a male world, but, and actually literally, because when I was young from three to seven, I lived on a street with 13 boys and I was the only girl and wow. it was at the time of Frankie and our gang you know and they had the club I hate girls and so all the boys were saying yeah we hate girls girls won't be in our club and I go say so what I can do whatever you can do and they go oh no you can't you're you're not a boy you can't do this you can't do that and so there was an eight that was two years older than I was and wait a second if she can do what we can do, we can decide three things she has to be able to do. If she can do them, <laughs> are you all agreed? Well, that's fair, right? Yeah, yeah. Having said that, that I love social, but I don't have a negative identification with social, but it's still third on my tracking. Right. Well, I hear you. And then at different times in our lives, I mean, you know, I'm old enough now. I, <laughs> I'm even a little bit older than you. I mean, 
self-preservation starts to come up more importantly. And I realized that actually I didn't pay a lot of attention to that when I was young and I didn't need to, but yeah. Yes. Yeah, of course, when I started having kids and had to support the family and, yep. you know, I mean, that was a big wake up call. And now of course, as I'm older, I have to pay attention to, I mean, I didn't even go see a doctor for years. You know what I mean? It was like, well, who wants to do that? And I mean, yeah. But then I did. Then I had to go. You know what I mean? And I was like, okay. So at some point, I don't know how many years ago it was, I had to enter a whole new world of, you know, medical care and dental care and, you know, uh, taking care of being more careful with my yeah. health and my body. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. I mean, how many people get up from a chair here? While, well, actually, while I'm coaching. And then because I broke my foot, but I got an extra and they said it wasn't broken. I'd stop taping it, but I got up on that foot. It gave way. And right. then I was trying to catch it and then hit this and injured everything and broke my wrist in both arms and my wrist and then bones in my hand. And it's like, oh my God, I'm pathetically weak. I'm weak. Right. Pathetic. So, so you have to pay a lot of attention to self-preservation. Yes. And at the same time, your your subtype still it's clearly sexual i mean you you just have the presentation and the style and the intensity of a sexual subtype it's just that your focus now is you've had to pay more attention to self yeah right? so i have all my stuff within <laughs> an arm's distance right my pencils my chapstick all, my eye drops all the things i need for right, right in arm's reach and then social in a way is what i'm doing one on one with people all day long with the coaching. All the, I do the groups as well. Right. But my favorites, even when I was physically teaching, which I haven't done really since COVID, the first time was going to be back in Vegas. But when you look at you know, the ideal, I would make it, as I mentioned earlier, so the group was more sexual. And then the self pres needs were met. And then the social. So I kind of made sure we were all happy. And that's still a priority for me that somehow plays out in the way that I'll teach. So those are the three instincts. Is there anything you want to say that you subtypes? Okay. Yeah, like a lot of people don't understand the self pres one. That well, yeah, I mean, there's been a few of those. And uh, I mean, I think, well, for one thing, the sexual nine has always been uh, interesting because yeah. sexual nines they have a, an intensity about them. It may be a quiet intensity. It may be it's a more there. receptive intensity. But they, they for sexual nines, it's just so important. And of course, they're very permeable. I mean, union is their thing. And of course, they can go into low-level union pretty easily. And of course, what we've seen as, as parents, you know, when one of the teenage girls who's a union nine is just so compelling and some big strong personality comes along and sweeps her up and takes her away and she doesn't wake up until 20 years later and go wait a minute where am i how did i get here you know what i mean yeah. um it's like if you're a union nine you got to be really careful how you do union but the point is that there's an impact there on others that we don't necessarily associate with nines nines are pretty easy very mediated you know, and in the it's, personality it's of quite the, seductive, you know, there's something very kind of juicy and, and moist about a yeah. sexual nine where right. they're like they're a fellow gut type, but they're you're more fluid, right? And, and guys, too, I don't mean just to oh, say, oh, yeah, the guys, you know, too, guys I, I'm like talking about the guys, <laughs> yeah, and so. They have this impact on people, which they actually don't realize until they learn something about this. Yeah, not only the enneagram, but the subtypes. You know, I mean, I I've talked to they're scintillating. Yeah, I mean, all sexual subtypes have some sort but of. But that can also be somewhat oceanic in their yes. way. I mean, yeah. I remember coaching a a, a a pastor, a woman who was a who was a you know, a, well, priest. I mean, a minister. You know, and. It, excellent. I mean, she could get, get up in front of her congregation and just kind of open the doors to this larger reality. And so in that role, she 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 was just amazing. You know what I mean? She brought people into this greater space and greater spiritual space. But in her relationships with people, she started getting a lot of kind of funny, aggressive 
responses from people. And we and what we tracked it down to was that her oceanic quality was like challenging people's boundaries. Yeah, of course. We're trying to push her off in some way. And nobody knew what was going on until we had the context of the Enneagram to understand this. She didn't know how to get it. I'm 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 well regarded. I'm friendly. I love people. And why are people being kind of weirdly aggressive with me? Well, you and this, that, and, and that's what it was. She was, she didn't understand her impact and how that was like challenging. Like, okay, well, I don't want to, you know, use this oceanic quality. Maybe I don't want to get wet. You yeah. know, maybe I want to drown in your, I mean, all under the surface, but very, very tangible. Indeed. And it was huge practice for her to understand that because it was getting in the way of her, her career and her mission. She just didn't, you know, and who yeah. would without the Enneagram? Yeah, the sexual nine can be like synchronized swimming. It's just like they can just get so in sync with the person of their choosing. And what, you know, what nine shared with me is that they they know who they want to have merge with them. But if the other person doesn't merge, they fill in the places and merge back. So right. they do emerge because they need the merge either way. Right. And at some point in their lives, and I've seen this with the people yeah. I've known, there's like this counter merging going exactly. on. Exactly. Like, I'm, I'm not merging with you. I'm not, don't even look at me because I'm not merging with you. You know, and it's like, <laughs> wait a minute, I'm just trying to talk to you. No, I'm not merging. I'm not merging. And I mean, I had a guy who I was close to a friend over the, I mean, he just like got into this space. He couldn't be in the same room with me for a number of years. And actually he came back around, thank goodness, you know what I mean? Cause he was able to kind of integrate it. But when he was trying to make his boundaries so that he wasn't always like giving up, giving away his whole old being, you know, to another person unconsciously, that kind of, you know, I mean, he was like really assertive in a way that wasn't, I mean, it wasn't very friendly or very nice for quite a while. So he, but it was the same issue, same, same darn issue. It was like, he was trying not to merge Yes. So he figured out how to do that gracefully with, you know. And choose the merging because he would just go on automatic. Right. So anyway, eventually it in, he integrated that. But um, Well, the, the nine, is, as you know, yes means maybe, and maybe means absolutely not for the nine. But for the eight, <laughs> no means maybe. Like people ask me something, I go, no, no, I can't do that. Wait a minute. What, what were you asking? And then, oh yeah, okay, I can do that. But my first impulse is no, because I don't want my boundaries. Right. Because if I say I'm going to do it, you know, come hell or high water, I'm going to do it or feel really bad if I have to cancel for some reason. I don't say maybe, and that means maybe, no. It's like, it's either yes or no. And it's usually no, and then tell me more. Okay, yes. <laughs> that reminds me of some... Uh... Very strong, a very strong counterphobic sex person who was a sexual sex, and you know, it was always no, that's not going to work. Yeah. As an eight, silly me, I thought that was it. Okay, okay, fine. You don't want to hear about it, fine. And I'm walking out the door, and it's like, no, no, come back here. We have to talk more. What do you mean <laughs> yeah. we have to talk more? You just said like, no, forget it. Yeah. It'll never work. I'm kind of dense, you know what I mean. So that yeah. was a good learning. And I think again, there was some combination of the counter six and the sexual subtype. The, yeah. the boundary was so I had to come out so strongly because otherwise maybe you'd be you'd losing it or something. So yeah, like Naran Ho said, the six feels like they're swallowed whole. Right. And so they try to have this, but really then if it's sexual, you're gonna want to choose who you have that union with. But right. then it's tested, constantly tested. And it the six who's phobic and they have a tri-type that's more phobic or more rigid like the 631 or a couple combinations then they're meeker than those that have sexual six and then there's going to be a stronger like my best friend is a sexual six and she's like you know a lot of fun but then she'll go all tough girl and i used before i knew the enneagram i go what 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 Going yeah. all up girl. Yeah, what, what's tough girl? And she goes, I'm, with me. I'm not doing that. You're just saying that. And I go, no, no, it's an energy. It's punchy. And you kind of get, what happened? And then she would figure it out. But that was just my code term for when she'd get all 
puffed up and going counterphobic kind of in her mind, rehearsing right. how she was going to deal with a difficult situation. But right. it's not like she was doing it to me. It was like her energy, you know, was just pushing those boundaries. And that's what the sexual six does. But on the other hand, she didn't realize that part of herself. Of course, we didn't know the Enneagram either. But that those, those are both tough ones. In fact, I found that all the sexuals are the, in a way, almost a counter type because it's the change element. So the self-pres is the status quo, holding on to reserves and the basics. And that then the social is how we need to relate with others, what rules right. kind of. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I, of course, I would pick out the self-pres four as a funny mix because they can do all the self-preservation things and have a nice home and supplies and they're warm and family or they have a little business. And then all of a sudden, the feeling of what's missing, the longing for what's missing comes up in them and they have to leave and move to Alaska. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you, that's happened several times. I said, yeah, I just stopped everything and I moved to Alaska. I said, well, what's going on here? Because I needed to follow my, and then they did the self-preservation thing in Alaska. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but I had one one friend, one little friend who actually is my, uh, uh, one of my translators in China. And she's, she's self-preservation for, and she says, and I was up in the high mountains one day and I was seeking the spiritual, I was on my quest. And I got way out there and all of a sudden I got a very strong message from my body that said, come down off this mountain or you will die. And I'm so glad she listened to that message because she was way beyond what was safe. Her dauntlessness turned into recklessness. She, it's like one thing to be dauntless and be courageous, and, but she went so far into recklessness. So enduring the self press for. Yes, I know. Get for the sake down. of their ideals. Right. That's a great example. So and she then, was anti self preservation yeah, part, yeah. part of the time. And that's, again, part of the paradox. Yes. People hear social subtype, they think it's about how many friends you have. Well, no, you it's about anti social. Your, you could be anti social and, and, and you could swing back and forth. Yes. You know, one day I think I have lots of friends. I'm so well connected with people all around the world. The next day I'm like, I don't have any friends and nobody's <laughs> really there for me. And all right. I mean, and I'm like, it happens so much. I'm like going, okay, stop. <laughs> <laughs> this is useless for you to be like caught in this, you know, just live, you know, do your best and yeah. hang out with people. And, you know, especially so. with sexual, I would always be thinking with, especially as a teenager, go, well, we're not as close as we used to be. I was always measuring the closeness as to how real the conversation was and how deep was and about us not about everyone else just the relationship whether it was a friend any friend and I had lots of friends but there was still the key relationship but if I'd known then that the sexuals always measuring um not as close as I used to be I guess that's going to be over yeah just like oh, okay I better exit before any exiting happens I gotta not care I gotta toughen up and not have it matter right but yeah, the the doing that just as a way of living, and yes, the each type is kind of interesting. Like another one that can be kind of confusing is the sexual one that will show their anger, and they'll have this yeah. type of zeal, or and that people think they're eights at first, and they think right. they're sexual because of the description. And yet they still want those rules. They've decided which rules they're going to follow and which they aren't. But they might break some rules if they think they're foolish, but they're going to be smart about how they break them. But it, again, it's the change element. So it's if we look at the self pres one as holding on to what we need to do to give brilliance to our being and checking and rechecking and kind of the, the hand wringer and then the social one is okay what rules should we all follow and make sure we get everybody to follow them and then the sexual one will what's the loophole how do i find the loophole and you're, you're going by the book but you're finding the loophole in the system but they're pretty amazing because they will work diligently to implement a new rule they think is better whereas i'm going to think like i'd say to my kids 
okay, when you get home, backpacks in your room and then come out and we start fixing dinner. And then they never come out of the room. I'd have to go get them. Okay, new rule, backpacks right here on the floor. We start fixing dinner. And then if it didn't work, new rule. So my rules were ever changing. And those are part of the boundaries of gut types is that right. it seems like we're definite, but we're only definite. We change our definiteness. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you for listening or watching. And yeah. you've been able to follow our kind of, you yeah. know, you know, whatever, you know. Concept. Yeah. Concept of the instinct. Big picture on all this stuff. And uh, uh, and thanks for, uh, you know, paying attention and giving your time. So and thanks to Catherine for.